Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Nancy Oweller. I'm the director of the School of Public Policy here at SFU upstairs, and uh, also a, I didn't wear my carbon tax button, but a passionate uh, defender, supporter of pricing our natural resources in a fulsome way. Um, I thank you all for coming, both you on the web and you in the audience. Uh, Carbon Talks does apologize for the short notice. Uh, they became aware of the esteemed panel's availability in town for a high-priced conference tomorrow. This is the cheap free one that is more engaging. So as part of the mandate of Carbon Talks and Simon Fraser University, you get the same story minus one speaker today. But that, so, you know, thank you. But we thought it would be a bonus for you to come. And we, we do like to thank Carbon Talks and Sustainable Prosperity for, for putting this on at short notice and providing the opportunity to hear from our distinguished speakers. Uh, just a note about uh, Carbon Talks. Uh, some of you have been uh, regular attendees at some of the talks. Carbon Talks is an initiative of SFU's Center for Dialogue, and its mandate is to provide a platform for discussion and dialogue on the important issue of our transition to a low, lower carbon economy. Um, the, here's the advertisement that it's not totally a free lunch. There are two more talks coming up, uh, so you do have more notice on that. One is October 3rd. It's called The Case for Wind Energy in BC. The speaker is Nicholas Heap, who is the BC Regional Director at the Canadian Wind Energy Association. And then there's a talk with a very esteemed speaker on November 19th. Uh, is title of the talk is what is happening to revenues from gasoline taxes uh, that would be me so it's totally a cheap a cheap ad all of these talks take place from 12:30 to 1:30 uh, here uh, in one of the rooms at SFU uh, the other sponsor today is sustainable prosperity and we have Stuart LG who is mr. sustainable prosperity he's the uh, uh, director of the Institute of Environment and the Chair of Sustainable Prosperity. Sustainable Prosperity works on the green economy. It's a think tank. It's, a, it's an action-oriented tank. They harness leading thinkers on trying to bring the concepts of using the market to achieve a sustainable and greener and competitive Canadian economy. So with me today, I have, as I said, the distinguished panel. To my left and our first speaker is James Mack. James is the head of the British Columbia Climate Action Secretariat, and he's going to be our lead speaker talking about our climate action plan, give you a bit of perspective on where we are and why we're doing what we're doing. Following James will be Stuart. Uh, Stuart's going to give you an update on the impact of the plan or what has been happening. Follow, and as I've already told you who he is, so I don't have to introduce him again. Following Stuart is Nick Rivers on my far right here. Nick is at the University of Ottawa in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, and he's a Canada Research Chair in Climate and Energy Policy. Nick's also a graduate of SFU, so that's why we can suck him back in. He <laughs> did his PhD here in the School of Resource and Environmental Management, so he's clearly an outstanding individual. And our final speaker, another outstanding individual, and we're delighted to have Mikhail Anderson, who's senior economist for the European Environment Agency, and he's a professor on leave from Arnhaus University in Denmark, and he is an outstanding and a well-known speaker on what's happening on the other side of the Atlantic. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to James, and I've asked the speakers to uh, try to keep their, their comments to about 15 minutes. I have a little card that says stop talking, so, uh, but uh, I'm sure they'll be well behaved so so I guess just first off so uh, my role is head of the climate action secretary and I just our job is as a small secretary to really try to provide a whole of government approach uh, both to reducing emissions in BC but also to adapting the impacts of climate change and some of the new opportunities in promoting a low carbon economy so what I'd like to do uh, is just situate the conversation that's happening in BC right now about the carbon tax within the climate action plan and just give you that high sense of what we're trying to do and where we're at. And just really quickly, BC set legislated targets to reduce its emissions uh, and those, our first emission reduction target is for this year in 2012. We'll see the final numbers about that in about a year and a half from now. 
And those go out, and in fact, we talk a lot about a 33% reduction by 2020, but probably the most important one is an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050. And those are world-leading targets, but they're actually quite consistent with the goals that many governments across the world have set in terms of dealing with climate change. In 2008, we brought in a plan, a comprehensive plan across all government, and the signature piece was to put a price on carbon, and that's a revenue neutral carbon tax. There's also a series of other signature policies, which uh, I'm not talking about today, but I'd be happy to answer questions. We're the first carbon neutral government in North America. We've got an adaptation strategy. We have 180 local governments that have signed a climate action charter. And we also have actions in every sector, meaning virtually every ministry and government is doing work on climate change and every sector of the economy is part of this initiative. Uh, we also importantly, uh, the, our Premier Clark has a BC jobs plan, which is a priority. And I think it's important to note that jobs plan actually commits that BC is and will remain a climate change leader. We're facing uh, tough, big discussions right now on how you actually get the economic growth that you want and deal with the climate change uh, agenda and basically our challenge is to figure that out. So it's still uh, very much a live and, and active file. Uh, BC's revenue neutral carbon tax, so just some of the basics uh, before the other speakers tell you about the analytics of it. It uh, started small and was increased over years. As of July of this year it's now $30 a tonne. It applies to the combustion of fossil fuels, so and it applies equally to everybody. There are no exemptions uh, under the carbon tax today, and that covers about 70% of our total emissions. To be uh, fully clear, there are emissions in BC that are not covered by the carbon tax. So you can see here agriculture, there's greenhouse gas emissions related to cattle, there's uh, methane that comes out of our landfills, which is counted in waste, deforestation is a significant activity. There's a series of industrial processes uh, which don't relate to combusting fossil fuels and are not covered, but are important uh, with other policy tools we have under the Climate Action Plan. The second point about the carbon tax is that uh, it brings in $1.2 billion in revenue uh, this year into government, and the Minister of Finance is obligated to provide that much or more back to the economy and, um, through other tax cuts. That's why it's called a revenue neutral carbon tax. And I've provided a high level breakdown here of what that includes, but it's a package deal and actually each year you can look at the budget and by law the government's required to show you uh, how much we get in, in the carbon tax and how we attribute the corresponding tax cuts out. There's a series of small personal tax cuts, there's a rural and northern homeowners benefit, there are personal income tax cuts, a low income tax credit and a series of business uh, tax cuts in particular, a reduction of the corporate tax rate by 2% or two, by two percentage points. And so that, in a very simple way, is, is how that works. Now, where we're at, uh, so our former Minister of Finance, Kevin Falcon, announced that we're uh, in undertaking a review of the revenue neutral carbon tax. And so, and this is the language that was used. Beginning a comprehensive review that will cover all aspects of the carbon tax, including revenue neutrality, and will consider the impact on the competitiveness of BC businesses. There's been a public input period, uh, formally that ended on August 31st. There is a standard pre-budget consultation process which is starting now. And actually many of uh, the people you're speaking to today are sparked in their interest because they've provided input and thoughts on how BC can um, uh, understand and improve upon this tool. And so we released in June a document called Making Progress on the Targets. We're actually required as well to report to British Columbians on what we're doing under the Climate Action Plan and how we're doing in real results. I'll just hit really quickly on some of those uh, top indicators. The first one in BC uh, is that our economy is relatively strong within Canada. Uh, and what this graph will show you is a percentage change from 2007 to 2011. So you can see as a red in British Columbia, we're basically on par or better than the Canadian average during that period. The second piece is that our emissions are tracking so that what we've said is we're within reach of our 2012 target. It's very hard with uh, only a few data points to understand a trend, so we don't want to overstate that objective. But we are definitely within reach, or what we've also called within striking distance of those targets. Depending on the effectiveness of the policies we have, depending on the decisions industries and British Columbians have made, uh, it is possible that we'll hit that target. 
And now those, what's important there is that's from 2007 to 2010. 2011, we have fossil fuel data. So we took a look at what's happening in BC. So these are all fossil fuels covered by the carbon tax. And we've looked at those trends as a percentage change from 2000 to 2011. Now I've simplified this. We've looked at provincial breakdowns, which makes it a lot messier to compare us against another province. But these trends look to us generally accurate. And a big reason why we put them out in late June was to try to get our colleagues to start beating them up, which they've done with uh, zeal. So, uh, so what we've seen is actually in all cases, so even in cases where, for example, motor gasoline sales in BC rose from 2008 to 2010, it's rising by a lower amount than Canada. What's interesting here, uh, it is too soon to make a correlation first off between what we're seeing and a policy, and secondly to differentiate the carbon tax from all the things that are happening in BC. But what's important here is these look like directions that show you something different is happening in BC. And it actually aligns with the theory on the carbon tax. You're seeing a lesser impact on natural gas use, a greater impact on oil. Uh, in fact, there's another one on coal use, which is a very small use of fuel in BC, which shows very dramatic changes in the use of that. And so that's uh, an interesting sign. The second one, and I would just say quite openly, we don't have a good sense of this, but we tried to find some indicators of the green economy, right? What are the signs of positive change in BC? And this is not an economist approach, this is more of an intuitive approach, but effectively to say everywhere we looked, BC is performing well in terms of adopting new clean energy and adopting new technologies. We have twice the Canadian average for adopting hybrid vehicles. We've got a 48% growth in clean tech sector sales over that period. We're the most active district energy market in Canada. 20% of all lead gold buildings certified since the carbon tax came into effect have happened in BC. We're now the third largest buyer of offsets in North America and we've retired 785,000 tons of offsets. And we have a Live Smart Energy Retrofit program. 8,400 small businesses have gone through that program. 5% of all eligible homes in BC have gone through that process. Those stats, for those of you who look at these issues elsewhere in Canada, are above the norm. So again, not entirely an issue of the carbon tax, probably speaks as much to the will of British Columbians and the priorities we face, but a clear indicator that we're spending less on fossil fuels as an economy and we're getting more in terms of clean energy and clean technology services. So I just want to say, and there's a few uh, friends in the crowd here who I know are going to, I can predict which questions you're going to hit me with, and so I want to end on a bit of a downer. So, you know. <laughs> For, uh, we've talked a lot about 2012. It is very difficult to understand what this means going to 2020 and 2050. And I just want to put up a challenge aside, and we've tried to be very transparent on this in our Making Progress document from June. One is, many sectors in BC are bending the curve. If you look at personal transportation in BC and you look at buildings, there is reason to be optimistic about what's going on. There are a lot of areas where the curves aren't going in the right way. Right? Natural gas production, new industrial projects, commercial off-road vehicles, and forest degradation. Now the issue there is not to be pessimistic, it's just to say that there's a lot of decisions we're going to be making between now and 2020 that's going to determine the pathway of those emissions. And BC is going to have a choice to make on all of those issues, as does every other jurisdiction around us that's dealing with the same thing. So we, uh, and we've been very clear that uh, we're going to need to do more to hit those targets and we're going to need to come up with new solutions to deal with those areas. The last piece I just want to leave as an epilogue is what does success look like and one of the things I think is really important about any subnational jurisdiction taking on action on climate change, your first objective is really to see if you can hit those greenhouse gas targets but the better objective is you can model success that will inspire broader action on climate change and I would say that it's very important that BC not achieve its targets in absence of anyone else doing it. It won't mean much for global action unless this has some resonance uh, with our partners. And I'd like to point to what California did on the tailpipe standard as a closer. California issued a tailpipe standard. BC was the first Canadian jurisdiction that supported that standard, faced many of the same criticisms about 
a small subsector of an economy doing something that would have competitiveness issues and had an economic distorting effect. Uh, Western Climate Initiative, 11 states and provinces grew to also support that. At that point, 79% of Canadian GDP supported a subnational policy initiative to improve vehicle standards. Uh, President Obama nationalized that in the U.S. Uh, uh, immediately on taking office, and Prime Minister Harper has also nationalized that in Canada. So that is the kind of model that we're looking for, is to see something that can grow and support and, and take over. And actually now, the next round of those tailpipe standards are being developed, and to be frank, British Columbia uh, is not, does not need to be involved much at all. It's the federal governments at both the Canadian and U.S. levels are taking care of that. And I think uh, California this year is implementing a cap and trade regime, which is a price on carbon. BC has a revenue neutral carbon tax, and we would uh, really love to see from an environmental and also an economic perspective to see broader adoption of these approaches, which is why we're actually quite excited about the type of conferences happening here in BC this week. So that's it for me. Okay. Can I get my card? Yeah, no, you didn't get the okay, card. Good. You can stop talking now. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, James. We'll turn to Stuart and I'll do this. So while Nancy loads that up, I'll uh, just give you the initial disclaimer, which is that uh, this is an adapted version of a presentation we gave to a bunch of um, sort of carbon tax experts from the BC government this morning. And as I was tweaking it for this audience on the way over, our float plane landed and hit the wake from a large boat, causing me to hit the delete button on the PowerPoint <laughs> I've been working on. So this has been... That's the best excuse I've ever heard. <laughs> the pilot actually apologized and said, I'm afraid to walk past you guys on the way back. Sorry. Um, anyway, so with, the, with the pizza stains all over my keyboard, I've tried to kind of recreate it and get it back in good shape. But if there's any pictures of my children or something on there... <laughs> Enjoy them. You got it. Okay. So, um, Nancy said, I have a dual identity. I'm a professor of law and economics at University of Ottawa. I'm also the chair of Sustainable Prosperity, which Nancy forgot to mention she's on the board of. Um, and um, as she said, it's, a, it's an attempt to, to bring together um, many of the leading scholars in the country, as well as some of the people from business, environmental groups, and, and uh, think tanks, working on environment and economy issues to get them on the same page, to get us out of this idea that the environment and the economy are different things moving in different directions, and to talk about how you actually build them so we can have both a stronger economy and a healthy environment. Uh, and obviously, this kind of policy here is a, an attempt to do that. And I got to say, as someone here from Ottawa, it is a joy to be in a jurisdiction that has a meaningful climate policy and is debating where to go with it, because there's not a lot of that going on in Ottawa these days. So good on you. Uh, BC's carbon tax, um, I won't go over more. We hadn't figured who would go next. So uh, all the stuff James said, uh, I agree with. And, uh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger agrees with it more importantly. So what I think isn't that important because the governator agreed with it. And so therefore, BC must be doing something right. Um, you might so, want to cut that line out of your talk. <laughs> Gary Coleman's next. If you okay. If, if, you, if you don't like Arnie, you've got to like Gary Coleman, right? So, Willis, how's it working, right? Who cares? And I'm going to talk primarily about the environmental and economic aspects. We could also get into some of the social issues uh, if we had more time, but maybe that will come up in the discussion period. Um, this is some of the similar numbers that, to what James showed you, but, but um, packaged a little different way. So this is the total. When you add up some of the little graphs James showed you, since the, since the carbon tax shift came in in 2008, how has BC's use of fuel changed relative to the rest of Canada? And you see there, it's gone down by over 16%. That's a dramatic change. That's a big change. Now, as Nick will say to you, we couldn't, I, don't think, I don't think all that's due to the carbon tax. In fact, I can't tell you how much, but pretty certainly not all of it. But almost certainly a, a meaningful part of it is. And we can get at trying to figure out how much of it it is. But the big point is it's moving in the right direction. And it's moving there at a, at a, a meaningful pace. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. And by the way, oftentimes when you hear this, people say, let me deal with the counter arguments. Well, the economy slowed down during that period. That's what caused it. In fact, BC's environment minister was quoted as saying that, which hopefully he was misquoted. Well, we've compared it to the rest of Canada. And I've got to tell you, we had an economic slowdown too in the rest of Canada. You weren't the only place that had an economic slowdown. And so that's not a reason why BC's fuel use is going down 16% relative to the rest of Canada. There's something else going on out here. Um, and then you often hear, well, more people are going across the border to buy gas in Bellingham, uh, leaving Kamloops and driving to Bellingham to save $3 or something like that. Okay, so let's just say that's a possibility theoretically. But 
the carbon tax applies across almost all fuel types in BC. So this breaks out how BC is done relative to the rest of Canada across all those fuel types. And you see that with one exception, BC's use of fossil fuels across the board has gone down very significantly compared to Canada. So it's not just about drivers crossing the border. There's a whole lot more going on. The one exception is aviation fuel. And you see there that can the Canada's use has dropped, BC's has gone up. Well, guess what? Aviation fuel is largely exempt from the carbon tax. So in a way, that actually reinforces this message. All the fuel types that are covered, BC's dropped. The one fuel type that isn't, Canada, the rest of Canada has actually done better than BC. Again, none of this would, would pass peer review audience in, a, in an economics journal because it was, there's not enough to show direct causation, but there's certainly a whole lot of smoke, even if we can't say there's a fire yet. It's probably a bad analogy yeah, for climate change. Don't talk about that this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, this is, the fact that this is happening is not surprising. Uh, when you charge more for something, people use less of it. You often get people making complicated op-eds in the Vancouver Sun, who I won't name, but who try to sort of say, well, you know, carbon taxes don't work. Well, if carbon taxes don't work, then all of economics is wrong, because part of the assumption is, is that when you charge more for something, people use less of it. Duh. And if you charge more for carbon or fuel, people will buy less of it. Duh. Right? And so this is a graph put forward by an economist in fancy language that says just that. When you charge more for fuel, people use less of it. And that little circled area down there is um, uh, fuel efficiency and use in Canada and the U.S. compared to the price they put on fuel, uh, the taxes they put on fuel. Nick provided me this graph, and it's a great one. And the places that have higher taxes use way less fuel than we do. Europeans generally are two to three times more energy efficient than North Americans, and they pay significantly more for their fuel. So that's not the only reason, but it's a big one. I won't use this because that's stealing Nick's thunder. He's going to talk about some great stuff. Um, Lastly, though, James talked about the GDP, and Mikhail Sku is going to, who he won't blow his own horn, but I'll tell you, he was in charge of what I consider to be the, the most far reaching study of the effects of carbon tax shifting ever done anywhere that looked at the effects of carbon tax shifting in six different European countries over a 15 to 20 year period, and actually did a very rigorous economic modeling of how those carbon tax shifts had affected GDP in those countries. We don't have that yet in Canada. Uh, I'd like to have it in the next few years, and we're going to count on Nick to deliver it. No pressure. Um, but um, what you see in BC is at least trending in that direction. You see since the carbon tax came in, overall GDP has gone up slightly compared to the rest of Canada. That's, you know, let's just say it's roughly equal. And the carbon tax is only a small part of that, but you can certainly say there's no evidence that it's had any meaningful negative effect. Uh, and that's about all you can say so far. But if you look at the experience in European countries, you can expect that over time, we may actually see small positive effects that rise over time due to the shifting, due to the idea that we're raising a tax on pollution but lowering a tax on labor, income, and investment. That's actually sending good economic signals. It's discouraging us from polluting, it's encouraging energy efficiency, and it's encouraging us to hire human beings, invest in capital and equipment, and invest in the economy. Those are all good signals. And so it's not surprising that over time, you'd expect you know, some overall growth in the economy. And we're starting to certainly see it here in BC. Clean tech sector has been growing at uh, about twice the national average in recent years in British Columbia. And, um, and there's some sectors, which we can talk about later, that you would expect to see winners and losers with every policy. So sectors that are particularly energy intensive um, uh, and fuel intensive is what I should say here. Um, you probably will see some small impacts and, and what we do about those is going to be part of the conversation going forward, which we'll talk about uh, as a panel, I think, in the conversation part. Anyway, tying that all up before I move on, um, snapshot, BC now has the lowest fuel use per capita in all of Canada. It has the lowest corporate and personal income taxes in all in Canada because of the carbon tax. It has a healthy economy with a very fast-growing clean tech sector. That's a pretty good policy uh, overall. Uh, and certainly The Economist thinks that. Uh, this is they wrote a big feature piece on it last year, uh, calling it the best climate policy in the world, the best design climate policy. And I think there's probably a lot to be said for that. Now, the other part, which I think got deleted on here, was, was James' point, too, which is it actually has been taxpayer positive that over the four-year period, taxpayers have gotten back about $500 million in tax cuts, more than they've paid in carbon taxes. So it actually has been, now from the provincial uh, finance minister's viewpoint, that might not be such a great thing. But it's actually been taxpayer positive over that period as well. Um, the other point, I guess, 
uh, do I have, how much time do I left, Nancy? I minutes? forgot to look, but you better wrap it up quickly. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> tough. I've been so engrossed in the talk. I don't know how much time you have, but it must be over by now. <laughs> you're, you're worse than the pilot of the plane. So let me just put this, I think, in a bigger context. Because to me, you know, there's a carbon tax, but, but it's really about an economic transition. Right? It's about moving towards a low-carbon economy, which almost all sort of serious economic thinkers think is where the economy of the future is going in the world. And I'm talking about not just, you know, the Sierra Club, but the IMF, the International Energy Agency. I mean, the people you don't consider to be radical environmentalists are, are all signaling the world's economy is moving towards a low-carbon economy, and that will be the terrain of competitiveness and success in the future. There's a bunch of indicators. Here you see investment in renewable energy growing three to four times faster than conventional, uh, the rest of the economy, and faster than any other energy source. Uh, investment in clean vehicles, hybrid cars, again, outpacing traditional car sales. I could go through a bunch of other examples, but the bottom line is, is that the economy of the future is likely to reward companies and countries that are things like energy polluting, energy efficient, low polluting, innovative, Oops. and just use their natural resources efficiently. And what drives you there is economic signals that reward that kind of behavior. And that's exactly what BC is doing. And this is a great quote. You see the price signal, powerful incentive, enhanced energy efficiency, innovation, suppliers of low-carbon products. Who do you think would say something like that? David Suzuki. Or... That's the head of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives in a report praising, a calling for a carbon price across Canada. And they would say in back rooms, they wouldn't say in that report, a BC-style carbon tax is probably the best way to do it. And I can tell you, in back rooms, Almost all, well, almost every energy CEO in Canada and many of the major industry CEOs would say the same thing. And they may soon, more and more, are starting to say it publicly, like the CEO of Shell and Suncor and Synovus, uh, that we need a carbon price and a BC style approach is actually the most efficient and effective way to get there. And actually, not having one is hurting our economy. So this year, TransAlta this summer pulled the plug on a multi billion dollar investment in carbon capture and storage. And they said the big reason is without a carbon price, the economics of this don't work. Shell pulled the plug got a multi-billion dollar investment in Iogen plant, high-tech clean energy. And again, they said, without a carbon price, the economics of this don't work. So it's actually starting to hurt our economy to not have a carbon price in the rest of Canada, interestingly enough. And so British Columbia is actually out ahead of the curve, and most of the rest of the developed world is going there too. In North America, we tend to think this is anomalous. But if you were in Australia or Europe or even uh, Korea or part, more, most parts of Asia, the idea of putting a price on carbon to drive low-carbon investment would be accepted as a good policy instrument. And BC is a leader in North America in that, but by no means in the world. I'll skip over a lot of this stuff about how they drive innovation. Trust me, they drive innovation. Um, the OECD criticizes us regularly for being one of the countries in the world that uses these environmental tax instruments the least. We don't put a price on environmental harm. We give it away for free. It's not just bad for the environment, it's bad for economic efficiency. You see this chart. This is the extent to which countries around the world use environmentally related taxes, and we're fighting for last place with the US in the OECD. So these kind of ideas that BC is a pioneer in uh, are actually things that other, other developed countries are starting to move in that direction already, and good for British Columbia for following that trend. Anyway, I'll just skip over some of the stuff that. The last point, anyone here you know, from finance departments or study fiscal issues? Because if you want, I'm not even going to get into this stuff. The finance people love this. Anyway, we'll skip it over. Okay, so last point, what next? Let me just say a few things and we'll, we'll leave it for the discussion afterwards. So where do we go with this? Since that was half the title, I have to say yeah, something about Yeah, you should say it. something about that. Um, and plus I've got Nancy's stop talking card yeah, right here, ready. so she can't get at it. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> basic one that you'd tell Gary Coleman don't reduce the thing. That would be the worst thing to do because you'd have all this capital investment and individual investment people have made over the last five years on the assumption of a carbon price that would all of a sudden be, be stranded and wasted. Whether you're a homeowner that's insulated your house or invested in fuel efficient vehicles or a company that's put in new technology, all of a sudden all the things that reward you for that behavior would, would be reversed. So don't reverse the gains you've made at the very least. A physician do no harm. Um, but the reality of it is, is if we're going to meet those BC targets, and I, I, I applaud James' optimism, most modeling suggests we need a, a higher carbon price and a meaningfully higher carbon price to get there. Now, you never know. Other things, other kinds of policies could backfill that. 
Um, but if you look at the kind of prices that it takes to make things like carbon capture and sequestration cost effective, you're looking at prices of $50 and above, maybe 50 to 100, depending on the particular technology. So that's the sweet spot, right? That's the point at which all of a sudden, some of the real things that are gonna start creating a tipping point in terms of a low carbon economy start to become cost effective. So keep going in the direction you're on right now. Um, expand it. As James said, about 30% of the sources aren't covered. And to me, one of the easiest ones, the low-hanging fruit, is fugitive emissions from oil and gas development aren't covered, right? I mean, the, the, they're not exactly in the poorhouse these days. Uh, they're a major producer of these greenhouse gases. For goodness sakes, let's start capturing the fugitive emissions that come from their development projects, and it'd be great for, your, uh, for paying off your deficit, too. And lastly, and maybe Nick and some of the other folks who knew, uh, know the economics of this better than I is, I know there's real talk in the government about giving relief to some sectors that are particularly affected as the price gets higher, and you hear cement and certain times of ag agriculture ones that are mentioned. And I'm not going to talk about whether we should or shouldn't do that, but if you're going to do it, do it the right way. And the worst thing to do would be to exempt them from the carbon tax, because you will create people who chronically have this problem. There's no incentive to become more energy efficient once you're exempted from the tax. Do the opposite. Give every one of them a lump sum payment, maybe equivalent to the average carbon efficiency of the industry, but they still pay the tax. So companies that drive their efficiency down are actually going to make money. You know, they'll still get the tax rebate, but if they can drive down their GHG emissions, they're actually going to come out ahead. There's still an incentive to innovate if you do that, but whatever you do, do not exempt them, or you're actually going to create the wrong signal, and you're going to, you're going to entrench carbon inefficiency and energy inefficiency in those sectors. That's it. <laughs> thanks, Stuart. Okay, we'll load Nick on. Uh, so thanks very much. I'm Nick Rivers uh, at the School of Public and International Affairs in Ottawa. Uh, and as Nancy said, I moved away from Vancouver uh, about a year and a half ago. And every time I come back, I've been back a couple times now, I hope it's raining because it uh, really tears my heart out to see this place in the sun after. <laughs> <laughs> I got out for a run this morning on the seawall, which is great. Um, I'm going to be talking, it's, it's tough going third, because uh, I'm going to be saying a lot of the same things, uh, maybe a little bit of a different, uh, different framing than, um, than we've heard already. I have I've really just two main points to make. Um, the first one is uh, to report some of the kind of early results of a study that I've been undertaking with a colleague. Uh, to try to, uh, to really get a sense of what the effect of, the, of the, um, the BC carbon tax has been on gasoline, retail gasoline sales in the province. And this is uh, uh, maybe going a little bit beyond the graphical analysis that we've seen so far. It's a statistical analysis where we try to control for um, what's, you know, the other potential drivers of, uh, of, uh, uh, of gasoline sales. So that's the first point I'm going to make. Uh, and the second point I'm going to talk about is, uh, is this idea of exemptions that Stuart finished up on. Uh, and I'm going to talk through um, one of the exemptions that was recently granted uh, to the agricultural sector, to the as, as agricultural subsector, uh, and, uh, and talk about some of the implications of that and, and ways to think about exemptions going forward. Uh, so like I said, the, the first point I want to make is, uh, relates to the impact of the BC carbon tax on retail gasoline sales. And I'm studying this with a colleague. Uh, we, uh, we decided to study gasoline for a few reasons. Um, first of all, it's an important source of emissions. Um, it's not as big as you'd think. It re represents roughly a sixth of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the province and roughly a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions that are covered by the, uh, by the BC carbon tax. Um, but it's still an important source. Um, it, it represents a highly visible source of emissions. So, you know, the one thing that people really react to uh, when they hear about the carbon tax is the price of, um, is the price of gas at the pump. Um, and, uh, and it's something where people all have you know, an anecdotal evidence of what they think the, the carbon tax has done. Um, and the, probably the main reason we st we're looking at it is because there's actually good data available. Um, so we have monthly data on gasoline sales in all the different provinces. Um, and so we're able to uh, generate some statistical inference about what the impact of the carbon tax has been. Um, and then another nice reason to study it is because there's lots of prior study on the gasoline sector, probably because there's lots of good data, it's an important fuel. Um, and so there's, there's been lots and lots of studies since the late 1970s that try to identify the impact of price changes on gasoline demand. So we're going to draw on some of those studies. Um, I'll give you a sense of what those studies say. Uh, and this goes to that figure that, that Stuart showed earlier. Um, most studies suggest that the, the responsiveness of consumers to, to gasoline price changes is fairly limited. 
Um, and so economists would say that gasoline demand is fairly inelastic. It doesn't change a lot with changing prices. Um, however, there is a much bigger long-run response than short-run response. And so in the, in the lingo, a short-run response uh, refers to the period when your, your equipment is kind of fixed and your big decisions about where to live and where to work are kind of fixed. And so the margin you have for changing your gasoline consumption is things like changing the mode of transport, you know, getting into a bike or versus getting into a car, or, uh, or changing the distance you drive. You can't change the car or you can't change your workplace. When economists talk about the long-run gasoline response, they're talking about those big decisions, changing the type of car you're going to drive or changing your workplace, that kind of thing. Um, and so again, the short-run response, as you'd imagine, is pretty limited, and the long-run response is a little bit bigger. And so if we take these, the results from these kind of previous studies and apply them to the BC carbon tax, um, we, we get a sense that you know, the, 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 this literature would show a pretty small response to the carbon tax so far, and definitely not in proportion to the, to the figures that were, um, that were shown earlier. And so if you take that short-run response from these previous studies of gasoline price changes, on uh, gasoline demand, you get somewhere about maybe around a 1% re uh, uh, reduction in gasoline sales uh, that would be attributed to the price change. And if you're looking more at the long run response, you might get a 1.5 or 2% reduction in gasoline sales. Um, and so this is pretty limited, and it's not really commensurate with the evidence that we're seeing. Um, I wanted to point to, to a couple of other recent studies that have, that have indicated that uh, that consumers respond quite differently to, to what we call idiosyncratic price changes or just general price fluctuations than they do to tax-induced changes. And so there's been, there's been two major efforts by really prominent researchers at some of the big U U.S. schools to study the, uh, the way that consumers respond to changes in excise taxes, which is the way that states uh, uh, imp uh, implement their, their ta gasoline taxes, and to compare those to kind of idiosyncratic, the way that consumers respond to idiosyncratic fluctuations in the, in the gasoline price, say, driven by crude oil price changes. And they've found that the response to these tax changes is way, way bigger than it is to these idiosyncratic price changes. And so the one study out of Berkeley and Michigan found that consumers have, have reduced their gasoline demand five times more vigorously when, when faced with a new excise tax than they have when faced with just a, you know, a, a general fluctuation in the price of gasoline. The, one, the study that, I, uh, that I've got here from Harvard and Cornell researchers suggest that the, the response to, to tax change is even bigger than that. It's you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of eight times as big as an idiosyncratic price change. Um, and so then we're getting uh, to numbers that are more commensurate with the numbers we're seeing from um, that, that Stuart and James presented. We're seeing that if you, if you take, translate these figures into the BC context, you might expect to see a 5 or 6 percent reduction in BC, uh, BC gasoline sales um, as a result of the, uh, the carbon tax. There's a few reasons that are thrown up uh, to explain this. Um, some of the ones that I think are, are reasonable are, are the idea of salience. Um, and so the idea that you know, these tax changes are often accompanied by, by really big media coverage. Gasoline's a sensitive issue. And so it, it really uh, it causes people to reevaluate their transportation decisions um, and to respond in a more um, informed way, perhaps. Uh, or enlightened way than they would to an idiosyncratic price change. If, if prices kind of steadily climbed uh, for, for no obvious reason, uh, the argument goes that people are less likely to switch their types of vehicle they're driving or switch their, uh, their major transportation choices than if there's a lot of media that covers, uh, that, that comes out around something like a carbon tax or an excise tax change. Um, another big explanation is, uh, is to do with expectations. People buy a car. They're they're driven. They're, the type of car they buy is driven by what their expectation of future gas prices are going to be. And if if it's a if it's a tax change, you get a sense that the the price change is going to be a permanent tax change or permanent price change. Whereas if it's just a general fluctuation in the crude oil market, you really have no idea. And so that, that again, that signal generates a more uh, a stronger signal for uh, for um, for consumers to respond to. And so, kind of driven by this literature, we we've undertaken a study of the BC carbon tax. Um, we've got monthly data, so we have a quite, quite a lot higher resolution data than was presented in the earlier studies. Um, and so the, the figure on the, uh, the right-hand side here is, uh, is just a snapshot of some of the monthly data we have covering, uh, covering BC gasoline sales over the last 20 years. Um, and what we're trying to do is measure the difference between that black line and that red line that I've drawn, which would be BC gasoline sales without the carbon tax. The problem, of course, is that we don't observe that red line. You know, we can't tell what BC, car what BC gasoline sales would have been without that carbon tax. And so we have to go with a, with a kind of statistical uh, methodolo methodology, which is similar to the other work that, uh, that, that looks at 
um, estimating this gasoline demand. So we compare what's happened in, in BC in a formal way to what's happened in BC in previous time periods, as well as what's happened in other provinces over the same time period and over previous time periods. And we try to control for other factors that would have influenced uh, gasoline sales over, those, over that whole time period, so things like income or uh, price of crude oil, excise taxes, the type of vehicles that are in play. And our estimate, and I can certainly send the paper to anyone who would like to see it, is that at $30 a ton, uh, we believe that BC's carbon tax has caused a roundup 7% reduction in, uh, in gasoline demand. Um, and so much bigger than would be, caused, would be suggested by this empirical literature that, um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and maybe not quite as big as the full extent of the change that we've witnessed in, uh, in, in uh, gasoline sales over that period. So that's the first, uh, the first kind of item that I wanted to talk about that I, we think we've been able to identify a causal effect of the BC gasoline tax or the BC carbon tax on gasoline sales. Um, the second one is a, as this is a 90 degree turn now, I want to talk about exemptions and, and rebating the revenues from the carbon tax. Um, and so every, as we all know, BC's uh, budget announced a review of the carbon tax with a particular focus on competitiveness and on the agricultural sector. You, can, you saw the, the, the wording around the review that James presented earlier. Um, and very shortly after the review, I think it was after, uh, I think I got my timelines right, the, uh, there was the BC government made an announcement that uh, there would be a, a temporary uh, annual one year, uh, 7.6 million rebate to the greenhouse sector. Um, uh, and so basically they were refunding the payments that the greenhouse sector had made uh, uh, in, in their carbon tax payments. Um, and this was, uh, this was in response to lobbying from the greenhouse sector that the carbon tax had worsened their international competitiveness. And so the, the stated aim of this rebate is, uh, I've got up here from, uh, the first one's from the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, in basically saying that the uh, BC's greenhouse sector will receive $7.6 million from the province in carbon tax relief, allowing producers to focus on their competitive edge, so to make them more competitive. And the second one's from the Greenhouse Growers Association, saying that uh, with this carbon tax rebate, BC growers will be able to better compete with other producers. Um, and so again, this is, uh, this is an exemption to the existing carbon tax, um, and that's what I wanted to get at in the, in the rest of this uh, talk. Um, so the, uh, if you go to the economic theory that, that talks about uh, you know, tax base uh, and about carbon tax in particular, the evidence suggests that exemptions are a poor way to ma maintain the competitiveness of an industry. Basically what an exemption does, if we're, if we're talking about meeting these, these fixed targets, Basically what an exemption does is, it, is it, it narrows the tax base and it forces the rate uh, uh, to increase for all the other sectors to hit the same target. Um, and this is exactly the opposite of what we think is good tax practice. Um, this, you know, uh, Paul Ryan in the US has been talking about uh, broaden the base, lower the rate, broaden the base, lower the rate. And that's essentially what I'm saying here, that, that, uh, that for the carbon tax, the, uh, the, the economically efficient way to go about things would be to cover as many sectors as possible with this, um, rather than to, to, to force all the effort on a smaller subsector of the sectors and force them to do more, because you'll be missing opportunities, in this case, from the Greenhouse Association. Um, and so this is a quote that I've presented here uh, from a German study of carbon tax exemptions. The Germans, uh, um, Mikhail might be able to tell us more about this, we're, uh, we're, we're struggling with the idea of carbon tax exemptions around uh, 1997, I think, um, and this this quote here suggests uh, the results here present presented here confirm standard uh, sorry standard intuition from the public finance and taxation literature, which suggests that exemptions can significantly increase the welfare cost of taxes. Uh, exemptions may retain jobs in subsidized sectors, but these jobs are expensive for society as a whole. Our calculations suggest that there may be more far less costly methods of retaining employment in specific industries. So again, if you want to retain employment in the, uh, in the greenhouse sector, and that's a perfectly legitimate goal, uh, there's probably better ways to go about it than exempting them from the carbon tax. Um, and this, this brings me to another kind of uh, you know, rule of thumb in economics, which is have as many policy instruments as you have objectives. Um, and in this case, uh, we seem to have multiple objectives. We want to reduce emissions, but we also want to, we seem to want to maintain international competitiveness and maybe profits in certain sectors. Uh, and the, the rule of thumb that I'm describing here says don't try to make the carbon tax do all that at once by, by, by creating exemptions. Instead, levy the carbon tax on all sectors and create these you know, specific targeted measures to address the other issues that you might have, profits and industrial or, and, uh, and competitiveness. 
Um, and so uh, Stuart mentioned that uh, you know, one way to go about maintaining profits for certain industries is to afford them lump sum transfers, and so basically to, to uh, compensate them for lost profits. And that way the, the incentive to reduce emissions is, is still there from the carbon tax, and you use another instrument to address this, this profitability issue, this distributional issue that's caused, uh, that, that's, uh, that seems to be a concern for government. Um, if, if international competitiveness is an issue, a lump sum payment's not going to address that. A lump sum payment it doesn't affect any decision, doesn't, shouldn't really affect decisions at the margin. It's basically a transfer to these shareholders of whatever company you're talking about. Uh, so the, a way to actually address this international competitiveness issue would be to subsidize sectors, uh, potentially in a similar way to what Stuart described, to, to make their cost of producing output less so that they're more able to compete with international competitors. And so if competitiveness is an issue, again, the message is don't exempt them from a carbon tax. Bring another, another measure in that finds a way to address the particular issue you have. And, and my, my final suggestion on this, on this exemptions and revenue recycling discussion is that there seems to need, be a need for a really clear uh, set of rules for defining what is a negatively affected sector or what is a negatively affected industry. Um, so, uh, so that this doesn't end up becoming a, you know, an annual subject of lobbying and negotiation. Um, the numbers that I put up here come out of the Waxman-Markey bill, which was the big climate bill that almost made it through the U.S. Uh, Senate in 2010. Um, and they had measures that were set up as the bill was built uh, to say, well, these are sectors that we think were likely to be negatively affected. They're ones that, that send a lot of their, their production overseas, uh, so they're trade exposed. And they're also ones that spend a lot of their, uh, that have a fairly high cost share for energy, so they're potentially likely to have costs go up. And so the, this waxman Markey bill said, let's create a list of these sectors, and we're not going to negotiate with anyone else. We're going to have this list of sectors, and we'll afford them some compensation in the kind of, in the kind of using the kind of mechanisms I described here, and we'll maintain the carbon tax, in their, in their case it was a cap and trade system, uh, whole. Um, so that's all I have to say. Um, I'll just reiterate my two main points. The, uh, the, it looks to me like we can attribute a causal effect uh, to the carbon, uh, the carbon tax in terms of gasoline sales, and our estimates are that it's about 7%. Um, and the, the second point was that exemptions, to me, are a poor way to address issues related to competitiveness or profitability. There's much more, uh, much more uh, effective tools for addressing those issues than to exempt them from carbon taxes. Perfect timing. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I'd really like to commend you for these uh, results you've presented here. I think if you will be presenting these figures also in the conference uh, the next two days, I think they will attract a lot of attention. Uh, I think the BC tax is probably uh, one of the best designed carbon taxes across the world, and I think a lot of attention should really be paid to uh, the experiences uh, coming from here. Having said that, uh, I've been asked now to uh, give a final contribution uh, to the panel, and now <clears throat> other speakers have uh, uh, been going into quite some detail on um, on the BC um, case, and so I, the rest of the world I will now deal with. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> for this, I've been, I've been allowed three more minutes, I think, than, uh, 18 minutes. than, than the other speakers. So, I'll, but I think I mean it's it's in the discussion in all countries that. Um, there's a global dimension of, of the carbon and greenhouse gas problem and the competitiveness issues that we're concerned about are of course very closely tied with that uh, global dimension. Um, so what I want to do now is that uh, I'll briefly mention the developments on carbon energy taxation in the tailwind of the Copenhagen Accord. Uh, I'll give you some of the findings from the study that was referred to before from uh, uh, these taxes in Europe, and then I'll look a bit into the future and put some options on the table um, as to how uh, we might um, move from this unilateral carbon energy taxation into some type of diplomacy uh, that could uh, entice emerging economies to also join a regime of a unilateral carbon energy taxation. And I think border tax adjustments here can play a key role. Uh, let's not forget uh, that uh, um, the problem that, uh, that we're facing is, is quite big and uh, um, 
the chance to meet this two degree target uh, is not very good uh, unless we really go for a dramatic stabilization uh, target. Uh, the, the green reduction curve here gives us a 75% chance of meeting the 2%, uh, tar the two degree target. Uh, but uh, we shouldn't forget that in actual fact, uh, we are on uh, one of the steep red curves that you see uh, to the upper left because emissions have been increasing uh, rapidly. Uh, before uh, COP15, we learned that US and China were equally the two uh, big global emitters. Uh, but please, uh, on the lower graph there, pay attention to the big increase in, in China's emissions. I know it's sometimes politi politically incorrect to emphasize the Chinese emissions, but I'll do it nevertheless, uh, because uh, <clears throat> China's emissions have been growing uh, much faster than anticipated by the IPCC. And the doubling of China's emissions, which you can see in that lower curve, which uh, came through in just uh, less than eight years, uh, was projected to happen only in 2025. Uh, so came through much quicker than, than expected. And when we take the most recent figures, we can now see China is indeed the largest global emitter with more than a quarter uh, of, of global emissions and the U.S. having uh, declined a bit. So I think this was what happened in uh, Copenhagen, that uh, China emerged there with the other emerging economies as a very influential player uh, in the global uh, talks on um, climate change policy. Uh, and I think they had been underestimated in the whole process leading up to uh, COP15. However, um, in the absence of uh, a binding international agreement, uh, it was agreed that uh, countries would uh, report their domestic measures. Uh, and we have seen there in the tailwind of COP15 that many uh, countries have um, reported measures also uh, making use of carbon energy taxation. In Australia, uh, the fall of Kevin Root's government uh, indeed was related to the proposed uh, cap and trade scheme. And with the Greens there in a pivotal position, what has emerged is has in fact now been agreed as a type of, uh, of a carbon tax that maybe later on will develop into a cap and trade scheme. We have seen the CO2 tax introduced here in, in Canada in British Columbia and also in some other provinces. We've also seen Japan agree a carbon tax earlier this year. Uh, it's um, a lower rate than the rate here in Canada, but it comes on top of pre-existing energy taxes um, and we will have a paper in the conference clarifying exactly the nature of the Japanese uh, scheme. Uh, we see a growing resentment against the, the cap-and-trade schemes also in the U.S. One person there who has spoken out against the cap-and-trade scheme was Michael Porter, uh, who says that this um, cap-and-trade model that has been patched together is far too complicated and blunts incentives that would enhance innovation and competitiveness. A carbon tax would lead to a rethinking of energy use, drive innovation in the green economy, and yield profits for, for first movers. This, he said, two years ago, but I think in Europe we can <coughs> confirm uh, this uh, skepticism because we have seen their uh, prices for uh, carbon permits uh, plummet. Uh, there's an oversupply <coughs> of these permits, and there's a volatility related to the carbon price with uh, cap and trade uh, that doesn't provide that stable signal uh, that investors are looking for uh, in, in the market for renewables. And also China is indeed discussing uh, carbon taxation um, and uh, have on the table proposals for carbon taxation. It was on the table when uh, the 12th uh, five-year plan uh, was agreed uh, last year. Uh, I was myself a member of a task force of international experts advising the Chinese government on experiences with carbon taxation. And uh, the aim of the Chinese is to introduce some type of carbon pricing uh, over the next uh, five-year plan uh, period. But whether they will, in the end, opt for taxes or cap and trade uh, is still uh, quite open. Uh, now, having said this, that a lot of uh, countries are considering uh, carbon taxes, uh, and some have also introduced it already, uh, what do tax experts uh, say about uh, carbon taxation? Well, if we uh, 
consider carbon taxation under the broader umbrella of ETR, which means environmental uh, tax reform, the shifting of uh, the tax burden away from labor, uh, being substituted then by carbon taxes and other environmentally related taxes. Um, there is a consensus in the literature that if you have this type of full revenue recycling, uh, then uh, this um, uh, can imply a, a chance for um, uh, some type of double dividend, uh, especially if these taxes replace other distortionary taxes, and then the debate goes on what are those distortionary taxes. Um, a lot, there's been a lot of concern about energy intensive industries, but it's important to remember that being uh, energy intensive is not the same as to be uh, trade intensive, and this has to do with the ratio between the weight and value of products in some sectors. In the COMITR project, we used historical data and uh, statistical analysis to map which are the sensitive sectors, and especially basic metals comes out as a sector that's sensitive as well to foreign price influences uh, uh, as uh, to uh, as also being very energy intensive, whereas cement, which is in uh, this category of non-metallic mineral products, um, yeah, while it's very energy intensive, it's actually not so trade intensive because the product is very heavy and is not so easily transported as many other uh, products. So there are some differences that have to be uh, taken into account. But in this project, we used uh, quite some um, econometric techniques to uh, disentangle the impacts of the carbon energy taxes which had been introduced in uh, seven European countries. And um, like you saw also for the BC tax, uh, it's possible to identify the impact there on total fuel demand uh, for these countries. And there was an overall decline of about uh, four to five percent in most of these uh, countries. Uh, Slovenia being the exception because in Slovenia they only renamed some taxes into carbon taxes but didn't really change the tax burden. So if you make only a symbolic exercise, you don't have much of an impact there. Um, the, the reduction in greenhouse gases that came through was slightly bigger because of changes and, and, and fuel shifting um, across sectors. Um, so overall, uh, here, uh, the impact was bigger and also differs between countries with the biggest impacts coming through in, in Sweden and, and Finland, these also being the countries having the, le uh, the less, um, lesser exemptions than uh, some of the other countries uh, in question here. Now, of course, the big uh, issue has been whether there is a double dividend from environment taxation or whether there are uh, rather negative impacts from uh, introducing uh, carbon taxes. Uh, the study here could not identify uh, negative impacts from uh, carbon energy taxes. Quite on the contrary, uh, most of the countries, um, uh, for, for most of the countries, the study indicates a small positive impact on GDP as a result of the tax shifting, uh, because labor uh, being less taxed uh, becomes uh, a more attractive uh, production factor. Uh, with the modeling, we can also tease out and simulate what would have happened if there had not been revenue recycling and if there had not been a shifting of the tax burden, but simply another tax being added as a carbon tax. And in that, uh, worst, let's say, worst case uh, scenario, um, the impacts are more neutral. But, but again, there's no uh, finding of a strong negative impact of introducing uh, carbon energy taxes in, in these European countries. Uh, it's also possible uh, with this um, study to compare uh, uh, trends in those countries that had environmental tax reform and those EU member states that did not have such uh, tax reforms. And um, uh, it's not possible to identify similar effects in the non-reform uh, countries. Finally, in the issue of, uh, of carbon leakage, uh, yes, the study does in identify some a small amount of carbon leakage, uh, the rate of about uh, 2 to 4 percent, uh, in fact, corresponds well to other studies, for instance, from the International Energy Agency, uh, 
uh, which uh, have reported rather higher leakage rates, but also for much higher tax rates than yes, the tax people rates. People know what carbon leakage is. Um, it's not, not what it might sound like at first blush. Okay, but um, um, carbon leakage is basically kind of a lingo for the fact that happens that you, if you um, introduce a, a carbon tax unilaterally, that uh, business will just move abroad or uh, the production of uh, those products will move abroad and so the carbon emissions will just take place elsewhere. That's the phenomenon of carbon leakage. Um, so overall we can see that uh, ETR contributed to a reduction of CO2 emissions in these European countries of 60 million tons and with, this is actually a significant contribution, more than 20% of the EU15 uh, Kyoto target. <clears throat> now, I show you these results from a model, uh, and it, a good question is, should we trust this model? Um, first of all, I would like to stress that here we use the historical data for uh, the responses in the member states. Uh, so it's based on actual time series data, whereas much of the modeling that we've seen elsewhere, and in particular coming from U.S. studies, is, is far more theoretical and based also on models that cannot always capture the kind of fuel shifting uh, that takes place when you have uh, carbon taxes. And there's a very high um, representation of the different sectors in this, uh, in this model. Um, so, and and it, the model which has been used, the so-called E3ME model, is also an officially um, recognized model that the European Union uses again and again for assessment purposes. So to sum up, what is the key political problem for such tax shifting? Because as we uh, may conclude from the figures, it's actually not really an economic problem uh, at, the, at the level of um, a country. Uh, the political problem is that these energy intensive industries that are maybe only 20% of all businesses, these energy intensive industries consume perhaps 60% uh, of all energy. And because these energy intensive industries are usually not very labor intensive, when you then shift the tax burden, they don't win quite as much as they lose. So at uh, company level, a revenue neutral uh, tax shifting will not be neutral and there will be winners and losers uh, when you introduce carbon taxes. But how much do they lose, these energy intensive industries? This we could also quantify in this study and here we look at four of the really energy intensive sectors being glass, cement, steel and non-ferrous metals. And uh, yes, the blue bar there shows the negative impact on the gross operating surplus. Uh, up to 5% for steel and non-ferrous metals. That might be the figure that company managers see immediately on their account sheet. But uh, what they should also factor in is the value of the lowered payroll tax, and they should also factor in that part of energy saving that can be uh, referred to the impact of the energy tax. So when you consider the, the green bar, you will see that the cost uh, of um, the tax shifting exercise is actually somewhat lower than what, um, let's say, the, the quick and dirty inspection of company accounts by the manager uh, may, may, may reveal. So the largest um, uh, cost we could identify was still only in the magnitude of 2% of gross operating surplus in these industries, which is not a major cost, I think, for a climate change uh, policy. And we had the same result as also in the BC tax, that energy taxes uh, uh, provide higher response than just fluctuations in energy prices. And I think there was a very good explanation provided before, so I will not go more into that. Uh, in this whole literature on competitiveness, uh, there is something which is called the Caldor paradox on competitiveness. And this is the paradox that uh, actually it is not so much uh, always unit labor costs that explain why some countries are more competitive than others, but it is much more about research and development and techno technological capacity. And our thinking is that these carbon energy taxes, in fact, improve research and development and new product lines. And in, by uh, improving productivity, this actually may explain uh, how this in increase in GDP comes about and also how the tests of international markets are being met. <clears throat> 
So, having uh, said uh, this about the positive impacts of, uh, of carbon energy taxes, let me then close with some uh, thinking about uh, how we can uh, get China and other emerging economies on board and also um, uh, find a way uh, that would uh, trigger the introduction of carbon uh, and energy taxes in these countries. And uh, first of all, it has to be said that China itself is very keen to explore this because the major bottleneck for China is actually um, energy supply. That's the major bottleneck for their economic growth. Um, but uh, their five-year plan is aiming for a quadrupling of their GDP uh, within the next 10 years, uh, while they only want to tolerate a doubling of their energy consumption. But even with such uh, a type of energy efficiency policy, you will see that uh, CO2 emissions in China are bound to increase even further. I showed you in the historical map how it had already doubled once, but it's bound to double again, even uh, with the best designed uh, energy efficiency uh, policies. Uh, so something has to happen, uh, because something must happen because this is not sustainable. Um, their position in the climate negotiations has been somewhat awkward. You know all the well-known uh, arguments about the historical responsibility of the old industrialized countries, and uh, China claims they are uh, to have still a right uh, to development. However, having worked in an expert task force with some of these Chinese experts, I can report that um, many of the technocrats there are very well aware of uh, the challenges as well in energy efficiency as in climate change policy. And then when it comes uh, to their, uh, to NDRC, their planning uh, unit, uh, their 3,000 man planning unit, and also um, uh, the Ministry of Finance and Ministry of Environment, actually I think there's a good understanding uh, of how a greening of the economy uh, can, be, can be made. The real problem is with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China, which was the unit that was responsible for the negotiations, because the Ministry of Foreign Affairs there is the last stronghold of, uh, of the Marxists. Uh, but uh, with the Ministry of Finance and, uh, the and the planning authority there, you do not find any Marxist economist, only good economists educated <laughs> at US universities. Um, it's the secret so, plan. <laughs> we have to find a way uh, to, uh, to uh, work with those people who are thinking along the same lines as us in, in China. And one thing that came up uh, also as part of the American position before COP15 was this idea of a border tax adjustment. Basically, the idea with a, a border tax adjustment is that uh, you introduce a penalty on imported products coming from other countries that uh, have not um, a carbon reduction uh, policy. And this would be mirrored then by uh, a premium, premium on those products that you export from, from your uh, own country. Now, this is a very, very sensitive issue with China. China is very afraid that uh, Western countries or Annex 1 countries would introduce such a border tax adjustment that would penalize uh, Chinese products. And um, uh, people there in the Ministry of Environment uh, suggested to us that um, actually um, uh, proposing such a border tax adjustment might be exactly the thing that would persuade in the end uh, the Chinese government to introduce their own carbon tax. Because when you follow their WTO regulations, when you have your own carbon tax, then it's not allowed to introduce a border tax adjustment uh, according to uh, CO2 uh, content. But there's a terribly complicated debate around the WTO rules and what is uh, uh, allowed. I, think I would like to recommend a very good study from the WTO Secretariat with UNEP that came out just before COP15, uh, which shows a way how you can introduce uh, border tax adjustments. And I think we, we need to think about keeping this option um, in, in the discussions, because um, this is something that is taken very seriously uh, in China and other emerging uh, economies. And I think we will also be discussing this in this uh, conference that we will have here in the next two days. So let me close this presentation uh, by addressing some of the skepticism that there is still there. A lot of um, good people say common sense. Do you really think a small carbon tax can make uh, the required uh, 
uh, difference here. But let me remind you that we're also talking about only small gradual increases in greenhouse gas concentrations that have dramatic uh, implications. And I think in the same way, minor but steady rises in the pricing of carbon will also slowly accumulate to fundamentally change the use of energy carriers in our economy. Thank you for your attention and here finally a recommendation of the book. Come back. He can't stay in the audience. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers. I, I think we've uh, you've seen a uh, a very clear set of presentations talking about carbon taxes and a particular emphasis on the, the BC situation. You've seen what's working. You've had a lot of evidence of uh, the effects of carbon taxes both here and in Europe. And just to remind you, the goal of a carbon tax, as all of the speakers have said, is to put a price on carbon and treat it like any other good that people care about and take initiatives to, you know, use it as we would use any other good in the economy and help us get off our high carbon diet. Moreover, it enables the low carbon substitutes to have a more level playing field because in a sense, without pricing carbon, without pricing the emissions from uh, energy consumption, we are subsidizing those sectors. So the tax allows that sort of equalization to occur and allows the, the non-carbon intensive sectors to flourish. And you've seen that the tax is working. There are you know, evidence it's early days since the introduction of BC's carbon tax, longer since uh, European countries have introduced pricing taxes and cap and trade. And there's very little evidence that, you know, that the economy as a whole has been damaged by the carbon tax, quite the contrary. The economy, at least in British Columbia, seems to be flourishing. And what Mikkel didn't show you, he showed you the most affected sectors. He did indicate that overall, in the countries with the higher tax rates, that uh, GDP growth was not dampened. In fact, it's slightly higher. So I want to start the, uh, the, the conversation with the audience, but I want to have just a really short lightning round. Uh, anybody watches the debaters, this will not be as funny but it will at least be quick. Um, the title also said, what's working and what's next? So I want to put our speakers on the spot for one minute, except you may be exempt. I'm exempt. Yeah. We'll exempt James. What do you think BC, BC should do next, Stuart? Um, well, the thing I want them to do is to raise the carbon tax they won't do. I would say extend it to apply to oil and gas fugitive emissions. OK. Nick? That was my uh, point as well, so I'll say they should raise it. <laughs> I mean, there's not, there's only, it's a good, it's a well-designed policy, so there's not too much tinkering you want to do with it, I think. Okay. Mikhail, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I, th I would uh, suggest that you uh, think about introducing a packaging tax according to the CO2 content of packaging, because that would be a first mile step to attach a price signal to all those products coming from abroad and where the producers have not paid any carbon taxes. Can we do that? Oh, I'm looking at him. Is that legal? <laughs> okay, well, we'll take that question or that uh, comment under advisement. Thank you. Okay, that gets us started. Who would like to be first? Over here. Um, Do you want a mic? Can you? I can speak loudly. That you, you're, can you summarize my uh, okay. question afterwards? Um, <clears throat> speaking of packaging, what about the other side of things? BC economy uh, has a lot to do with coal exports, and we're sending that all to China, and they're burning it, and it's affecting their their carbon outputs. So, should we somehow tax the mining of the resources of the the natural gas that we're that we're, that we're fracking and the coal and, and things like that? And how, what, what can BC do to improve that aspect of the supply chain? Who wants to tackle that, James? Well, I just, I, so this is actually a, a pretty common debate in, in BC right now, and I guess the first answer I'd give is I think it's a good debate to have. I think British Columbians should get a sense of what type of economy they want to build. Just from a strict climate perspective, I'm always uh, put a lot of caution on people who want to start thinking about what happens with our goods once they meet, meet the border. The first off is typically if you punish your exports, they just reward other exporters who, who care less. So you don't 
our sense is you typically don't see a global environmental benefit in that case. Uh, the second one is it leads to a lot of dangerous logical problems because one of the things we often are tempted to do is to try to look at our sectors and make the best possible case around emissions. And if you start trying to net them out, you get into weird situations. Japan sells us hybrid vehicles. When we choose to buy a hybrid, we, take we pay more and we take credit for that reduction. That's our choice. If Japan started claiming credit for all of the hybrid vehicles sold in BC, we'd be furious. And so it just gets hard to net those out. Uh, it's a good thing to think about, and we think about that with liquefied natural gas exports. Uh, that is a good transition fuel to low-carbon economy in Asia. And so we want to think about that when we set our natural gas strategy in BC. But BC said, we're going to look seriously at our own emissions and think about carbon capture and storage, use of clean energy. And, you know, so I would just caution about rushing too quick to sort of picking those villains because often it leads you to complicated places. And the last thing I'd say is internationally what's happened is people have said, you make decisions within your own borders, be held accountable to those decisions that you make for the emissions in your borders. And that's just kind of how it, how it works. But, you know, past that, um, if there are ideas, we have to be under a carbon tax review and you're happy to take them forward. Okay, I'm going to take another question in a minute, but I want to just say to anybody that's uh, watching the webcast, please feel free to tweet your questions to at Carbon Talks, and somebody will tell me what they are, right? Because I'm not, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not listening. Mark? No. Um, I just want to follow up on James's point. Um, I was going to let him off easy, but, um, you know, I think the issue around LNG, I think, is one that's really a thorny one right now. Um, pretty much every day you see something in the papers with even bigger estimates of new pipeline capacity and uh, plants for LNG. A lot of the carbon will ultimately be combusted in Asia. But I think the going down the route that is outlined by the natural gas strategy, much less the even more ambitious plants that we are now hearing in the press, essentially means that BC will not be able to meet its domestic GHG targets for 2020. Like, the map just doesn't add up. And, you know, ultimately we're looking at about 200 to 300 million tons of CO2 um, per year added to the global uh, environment. And that's not even counting fugitive emissions. That's just assuming all of it is converted uh, into CO2 equivalent. So, I mean, surely we have to take some responsibility for that as British Columbians, even if it's the Chinese or the Japanese who will ultimately combust it. Well, I guess uh, taking responsibility in terms of the way that we make decisions, sure. Like I think, and I don't think anyone has uh, not gone forward and said what those estimates are. But I would tell you, there's a lot of unknowns around those emissions, and so where we're at in terms of BC, first off, is I think we have said it's a tough issue to try to think about how to kickstart natural gas exports and reach our targets. So one thing. I would say, just to communicate on behalf of the Premier and Cabinet, is they've been very clear that they get the fact that this is hard. What they've set are some principles in the LNG strategy, one of which is they want to maintain a leadership on climate change and reduce emissions. And so the task for us, to be frank, is figure it out. Uh, and there's going to be some tough trade-offs there. Committing to using clean energy for the first LNG plants will be the first time anywhere in the world that that's been done. And the emissions benefit of that so it may be a, an increase, but relative to what anyone else in the world has done, it is uh, an absolute game changer. I'd note the climate negotiations this year are in Doha, Qatar, the world's largest exporter of LNG. That's a pretty big challenge to throw down to an international LNG community. And we're boxed by the fact that many jurisdictions that want to reduce their emissions are looking to natural gas. And we do a lot of work with the Chinese on climate policy. Secretary of Energy for the U.S. calls natural gas a transition fuel to low carbon economy. So I think you're right. You don't want to hide behind cute answers. You want to get the facts on the table. I think there's a willingness to make tough decisions. And uh, there's no easy way through it. And we're going to have to, to figure that out. I know that's cute, Mark, but you know, you and I go through this from time to time. And I'd, I'd love to follow up again later. So Let me just jump in and give James a bit of a break because he's um, going to have to carry all the load on this one. Um, I guess a couple of things. One is, I think 
One should never say that we should disavow ourselves of responsibility for how the products we produce are, are used. I mean, they tried that in Quebec with asbestos for many years. And, uh, and it's, so you can't just say, you know, we produce it, it's their problem how they use it. On the other hand, I, I tend to agree with James that from a climate perspective, really it's hard to imagine a, a form of carbon accounting other than count it as emitted at the time the atmosphere sees it. If, if you don't stick with that principle, then it's just going to get massively complex because we don't know how it's going to get combusted, right? We don't know if it'll be what kind of vehicles, what kind of process. So practically, you kind of have to do it that way where you, you measure the emissions at the point of combustion. But there's a lot we could do. And I, let me give you a few ideas. So I think the first thing is it's very hard for us to lecture other countries given our current track record. We have got to lead by example before we have any position at all in the international world to start telling other countries what they should do about energy efficiency, we're near the back of the pack right now. Now, BC probably isn't, but as a nation, we are. Um, and so if once we have a little bit higher moral ground, we'll be in a bit better position to start talking to China and others about what they should be doing, because we can talk about the things we're doing. And this carbon tax is probably the best story we have in Canada, and we should talk about it with pride more and more. Second thing is there are things we, we can have some control over. I mean, as... as um, Mikhail Scoo suggested, you can begin to look at things like border tax adjustments. Um, now, obviously, it should be more than just British Columbia because the world isn't going to quake with fear if BC <laughs> talks about you know, introducing a border tax adjustment for imports into British Columbia. But once you've got a few more jurisdictions doing this stuff, then it can actually start to have some effect. Um, you could do other things. Our role as an investor or as a donor in those countries. We could start tying uh, our aid, our, our donations, our investment as a nation to countries that have responsible climate policies and use it to assist those policies. Uh, you could even, and I don't think we're going to go there in the near future, uh, talk about actually linking uh, exports of products and giving preferential treatment to countries that have responsible climate policies in place in terms of those countries to which we would um, give preferential treatment. Now, to how you'd get the private sector to do that is going to start to get into more difficult terrain. But there's lots of things we could do. But the bottom line is I would love to live in a world in which we immediately made a leap to low-carbon technology and reduced our fossil fuel footprint dramatically. And we shouldn't restrain the scope of our imagination that we might be able to get there. But I think it's more likely that we'll live in a world in which, like we're turning a tanker, we're going to gradually move in that direction and so to do that, we are still going to be using fossil fuels for the foreseeable years and probably two or three decades. They're going to be produced somewhere. And our niche as Canada should be to become the world's most environmentally responsible producer of those fuels. If the world's going to con consume those products, at the very least, we should carve out a niche as setting an example of how you become a producer of those that minimizes the environmental footprint, and not just carbon, water and biodiversity as well, while trying to encourage us to move off them at the same time. That's what I would recommend anyway. Okay, Don. I have a question for Nick and possibly for you, uh, Nancy, if you have a different hat to, uh, to put on. But on the 7% uh, uh, reduction and attributing that to the carbon tax, we have also in the Lower Mainland, which is half the BC population, have some very significant taxes Hi. on gasoline. Oh. Um, they your dulcet tones are not being heard at the back. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, we have some very significant taxes on gasoline that are not carbon taxes and are not called carbon taxes, but are still taxes on gasoline. So when you're looking at that component, uh, have you looked at the TransLink tax and what impact it has in, in, this, in this reduction? So thanks for the question. We, uh, we did control for other excise taxes as well as the taxes that are in... Um, in Vancouver, I think Victoria as well, and uh, and Montreal has one as well. Is that right? Has a municipal transit levy. Um, anyway, we did we did control for those uh, factors. So we, the the number you're seeing is the carbon tax alone. After all the other excise taxes have been controlled for. We, we like to blame the carbon tax for our loss of tax revenue for the uh, transportation system. So <laughs> it's not our tax; it's their tax. Their ta his tax. <laughs> Yeah. But it's good. It's good because people, we've seen a substantial, just to follow up on that, on, you know, I, I think what you've heard from this panel is, is focusing not just on who's affected in the negative direction, but let's look at who's been affected in the positive direction. Uh, public transit ridership in Greater Vancouver is up from 2010. We had a small party here that year uh, called the Olympics. Uh, we beat that record in 2011, and we beat it again in 2000, uh, so far, first two quarters of 2012 in terms of people increase in ridership on public transit. 
So why is that a good thing? Well, it gets people out of their cars, reduces GHG emissions, reduces congestions, makes healthier people. So that's the, that's the speech. I'll take you in the back, sir, with the uh, orange hat. The coal from BC is metallurgical coal. It's used for smelting iron ore. It's very high quality stuff and a lot of people like it. So there's no way of smelting iron without using coal. So don't worry about that. Uh, another question. How do you plan to reduce emissions in the transportation sector? I mean, like a Boeing 747 takes off with 346,000 pounds of fuel. The MMRSIC? Yeah. Uh, well, I, one thing, the aviation, I'm not an expert in the aviation industry, but the aviation industry has made huge gains on the actual airfoil. So the, the new airplanes that are coming out with the composite materials are consuming, and I'm making the number up, but it's in the order of you know, 10, 20, 30 percent less fuel per kilometer traveled. And part of that is technological change. And I think what you've heard the panel say is if we price carbon, it makes those investments pay off more quickly. So if we have, like, if you want to pay more for your petrol, remember Stuart's picture of demand curve sloping down? The higher the price, the more you want to e economize on using that fuel. So the airline industry, the manufacturing industry, has invested significantly in technological changes that reduce the amount of petrol, of aviation fuel consumed per kilometer traveled. And it, it is substantial. Uh, you know, one of our own domestic industries, uh, Bombardier, uh, one reason their commuter jets have re uh, replaced, displaced other aircraft is because they're much more fuel efficient. So sure, it's a challenge, but you see the response of industry to responding to that challenge. Mm -hmm. Shauna? This is a question for Stuart. Uh, Stuart, you used the term fugitive emissions. I wonder if you could, there's real de difference in definition between what the oil and gas sector might consider a fugitive emission in Canada, what the federal government would consider a fugitive emission in Canada, and also what the global community thinks is a fugitive emission. How are you defining it? And if we're looking at that being the area of greatest concern in British Columbia, how are we going to measure it? Um, let me rapidly say that uh, I am anything but an expert in the, the technical side of fugitive emissions. The beauty of being a lawyer and an economist is I can talk well about what the policy instruments are, but when you wade too deeply into the inside of the machine, there's lots of people here uh, who would know that better than I. So. I may pass that. I mean, fugitive emissions basically are when you're producing oil and gas or other products in the course of both uh, transporting, moving, and bringing the stuff up, some of it leaks out. Um, that's sort of the conventional uh, layperson's definition for those of you who know of it. Um, the people I know in the industry, and I actually spend far more time talking to oil companies than I ever thought I would in my life, uh, tell me that their capacity to measure that is much better than it was five years ago. Um, They've begun to give me sort of complex engineering diagrams to show where that is, and I would gobble it completely if I tried to relay any of them here. But uh, I trust them when they say they're getting better at it, and they think that they're now in a position that they could measure that more effectively. But I'll pass it to anyone else here who actually understands the technology of how you would do it better, because I don't. I, th I think there's just a really important point here. Um, Carbon Talks has done a whole study on fugitive emissions, and one of the important pieces is when the oil and gas sector talks about it, they talk about it in terms of what, how you've just defined it, the unintentional. Then there's all the flaring, which they would see as intentional. That they don't believe should be measured or uh, should be um, taxed or considered within both the federal re regulations. The international community does look at both and that's they have easy. yeah that's a no-brainer I mean, it, it's a no-brainer it, but really it's a really important gas. point uh -huh. and i encourage anyone to look at the discussion guide and the final report on the fugitive emissions discussions that we did okay. james do you want to jump well, in? i think that i i guess uh you know we use different terms and in fact increasingly in bc what you hear is people talk about non-combustion emissions <laughs> and what they're saying is emissions not covered by the carbon tax alberta actually has a uh, price on carbon for their large emitters, which covers a broader, so it's a smaller price only on large emitters, but a, a broader range of emissions than covered by the carbon tax. And it's fairly consistent with what California will cover under their cap and trade regime. So we actually have in BC a legal requirement for those emitters to report on their emissions. And so you can actually look at any uh, oil and gas operation in BC and see what they're emitting and according to what activity. We've got that for the 2010 year and soon for 2011. 
And I think it then gets down to a debate around economics and engineering around and tax policy on is it a good idea to do that, and if so, what are the clear ones to do? But there is a pretty good information base there. And you're right, there's a problem in that we call it different things in different places, but we actually have a good handle on what the emissions are. Okay, I'm going to take a question from Webland, uh, just so they don't feel left out. Uh, why not make more investments to use the LNG here to transform mm -hmm. our transportation sector instead of just shipping it to Asia? Yeah, and I think that's a good uh, that's a good question to ask. And I would point people: there is actually a um, the government's put out two pieces. One is a strategy on liquefied natural gas, and the second one is a natural gas strategy. And I um, won't say too much on those because they're slightly out of my domain. But there are a series of initiatives there promoting natural gas use in BC. Uh, and just to be clear, there's natural gas, and then we sometimes talk about compressed natural gas and liquefied natural gas. But there are interesting applications in BC. Could we use natural gas to power ferries? Um, Fortis BC is looking at natural gas in the heavy duty vehicles area. So, uh, waste management trucks, which are just huge vehicles driving back and forth all day, there's an enormously positive business case there. And they're actually seeing quite an interesting business case to move in that way. So there's a bunch of applications in BC where natural gas is an economic opportunity and also a climate solution. And we're seeing increasingly uh, BC companies actually see that as an export opportunity in other jurisdictions. And there's kind of an interesting thing we have in BC that our climate partners happen to also be our exports. And uh, we're seeing a lot of matchmaking <coughs> happening in that field. So it's a good point and definitely something we're trying to do. Up here. There's been an outlier question um, in the public health sector. Um, is it possible to look at other measurements of benefits of carbon tax rather than just, just reduction in gasoline use, but in terms of atmospheric pollution and um, increasing healthy, healthier forms of transportation, such like, which I would have thought would help them in terms of selling a whole government approach, which could mm -hmm. work to BC, but also in other provinces as well. We asked the, so there's the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, and I'll just give a shameless plug that Tom Peterson, the director, is sitting here in the front. Uh, I think in 2008, in the fall of 2008, they did a, a preliminary look at that issue. What are the health issues related to doing good climate policy work? And to be frank, uh, you know, I, I don't have anyone on my team that could do it. I'd love it. Like, in fact, if I don't know your background, but if someone would like to take a look at that, and run us some studies, we'd love to see it. Because we've identified a potential link. We have kind of a sense of the order of magnitude, but you know we're just now seeing early sense of results. It'd be a great thing to look at on the health benefits from uh, climate leadership. If you want to look there's, at there's certainly, Nick, Nick's first. Okay. Sorry. There's certainly been study in, uh, in the US of the, uh, of the uh, externalities associated with fuel consumption. And they're, they're all the things you say. They're, they're, uh, they're um, you know, air pollution emissions. A big one is, uh, is accidents from, uh, from roads in, in, that, that cause both loss of uh, working days as well as death. Um, and so the, when you actually try to tally up what we think are the economic benefits associated with fuel pricing, carbon dioxide emissions comes kind of low down the list because the, the other benefits, things like accidents, things like air pollution, things like congestion are so, so big. Um, so there's lots of other reasons to do to do a gasoline tax as well, other than CO2. And they're costly. Congestion, one study finds congestion costs in Vancouver are about a billion dollars a year in lost wages, lost productivity. So it all fits together. Do you, is it okay? I'd cut you off. Do you want if to you want to see numbers, the federal government's actually just bringing in regulations uh, for GHG emissions from coal energy. And there's a cost-benefit analysis they had to do before bringing that in. So they've tried to quantify the economic benefits to Canada of these coal rigs, and they're not the strongest rigs, but the health, the reduced health costs are the largest benefit that they, they identify, more than just the greenhouse gas reductions. Yeah, and that tends to be the, the stuff I've looked at. The health benefits are huge, but the point is really well taken that, you know, again, we should focus on not just the cost side, but the benefit side of, of reducing these things. I've, I've been nodding at people that are in the queue, and I'll say, okay, <laughs> we've got a lot in the queue. Up here, and then here, and then back there. 
Hi, I just want to thank the panelists for a really fascinating discussion. Um, I'm uh, James Glave. I'm with Clean Energy Canada at Tides Canada, and I wanted to ask a question that's uh, a, con a thinly veiled plug at the same time. Uh, <laughs> and that is, uh, we've been collaborating with a bunch of other great organizations, including the David Suzuki Foundation, on a project called the Better Future Fund. Uh, and at the betterfuturefund.ca, uh, that's focused on this whole, the emissions that are not subject to the carbon tax. If they were, uh, what kind of revenue could that generate and how could that be directed to create a better future for British Columbians? And I just pulled up the website and so far since July 1st, when the tax went up to 30 bucks a ton, uh, closing in on $28 million uh, could have been collected that hasn't been. And so I just wanted to ask the panel, you know, as economists, those of you who are uh, <clears throat> sort of what the issues are surrounding, you know, the tax that was introduced as revenue neutral, uh, what are the what are the implications and the challenges of uh, in expanding it, taking some of that neutrality away and returning direct benefits uh, to BC communities? Is it doable? What would be the implications? I'm sure Translate would be interested to access some of that. We want all your cash. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You didn't hear me say that. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, do you want me to start? I mean, uh, number one, uh, as, as Mikhail said, and Stuart, uh, uh, an economic sort of paradigm is broaden the base. You know, if you broaden the base, you do not have to increase the rate as much on everybody. So it's, it's again, it's reducing that free lunch. So the principle of having as broad a base as practically, uh, you know, as you're practically capable of doing is a good sound principle. What you do with the revenue is, is a decision I think British Columbians should address more broadly. Um, you know, we, and again, as some of the speakers said, there's some sectors that simply cannot benefit from the tax cuts for a variety of reasons. They might not be labor intensive, et cetera. So there might be other uses, some of which is, again, the speakers have said, you know, assisting in a non-exemption way, as Nick said, those sectors that might have a disproportionate effect, uh, you know, putting it into infrastructure that would be supportive of reducing carbon emissions is another, is another principle. I would hope that in the review of the carbon tax, those issues uh, are addressed. Nick, or anybody else want to jump in? It's, it's interesting, when the tax came in, um, I thought, you know, this, this idea of revenue neutrality would be the big selling point for the tax, that um, if, if consumers if, uh, could see that this if an instrument, which seemed really transparent to me, was collecting no more revenue than it was giving back, it would, you know, this, this message of a tax shift would get through and it wouldn't be something that raised a lot of opposition. And I was really wrong about that, because People seem to want to see, you know, that just the fact that prices are going up and should that sh should itself lead to a reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions and fuel demand, isn't a transparent thing. People want to see the money raised and put into, uh, you know, green investments. They want to see windmills built or they want to see a new transit line. Um, and if that's, you know, if that's the case, then I don't see any problem with that. I, I was under the impression that a that a revenue neutral tax cut would be the easiest one to sell. And I don't, I don't think I believe that anymore. I think that people want to see their money going to something, to some sort of productive source of investment. Um, and so uh, I think that's a conversation that should be had in, the, in, the, in this review. But, but to be very clear, that's on any increment in the tax, because if we were to reallocate the existing revenue to, uh, in, in a different way, we would have to increase corporate and personal income taxes or reduce uh, the, the uh, payments we give to those folks that are not uh, as able to adjust their emissions. So yeah, people are talking about increments from the $30. The other thing I'd say is it's not, I mean, how government should spend your tax dollars, which is your question, is not an economic question. It's a fundamentally political question. Right. Um, but there are lots of models. So if you just look to the, to the east, I guess, to Alberta, the revenues that are derived from their emissions trading system don't go into tax cuts at all. They all get reinvested in low carbon practices and technology. So they've taken the kind of model you're talking about. Not that I would expect you'd ever be looking to Alberta's government as a model for you, but that's what they've done, right? Whether it be carbon capture and storage or farm practices that are more fuel efficient, forestry practices for landowners. The one thing I'd caution you, though, is, and I'm sure you've thought about this, the, rur the rural urban politics of this stuff are really critical. and. It's a lot easier to think about low carbon investment and in infrastructure in an urban setting than it is in a rural setting. And so if you were going to do that, you'd want to think long and hard about how you would actually reallocate those funds so they had as much of an impact on driving uh, carbon efficiency in rural BC as they would in urban BC. Okay. 
I guess if I could, the only thing I would add on that, just to take it out of a BC context, uh, we're actually getting a lot of interest uh, within U.S. conservative circles. Uh, you know, there's a view of many U.S. conservatives that that their values I, align very well with the carbon tax because it's a revenue neutral carbon tax. And so, I think, uh, you know, I, revenue neutrality is up for public input, and I think, you know, let's see where that goes. And I think it's good debate. I would just say in terms of what makes the BC carbon tax interesting to other people who may adopt it, definitely in the U.S. context where they're considering the end of uh, what we're put in as temporary tax reduction measures in terms of personal income taxes and corporate taxes, they're actually looking at the carbon tax as kind of a, I don't like taxes, but I like this one, I hate this one less than that one. And, uh, and you know, that's not actually a bad way to frame it. All taxes from an economic perspective have some kind of leg on the economy. So you're, you're choosing your, your tools. And I think uh, it's a very important issue in the U.S. context is that's what they find most interesting about ours. The California debate on cap and trade right now uh, is, in fact, it's a carbon price that generates a significant amount of revenue. And all the discussions are on who gets to spend the money. And I think that's exciting until you make those decisions, and then it gets hard, right? Because then you're defending who benefited and who lost from that. And uh, you know, again, I'm not saying one's better than the other, but it's uh, it's an important trade-off to figure out. Okay, we've got time for a couple more. I've got you, and then up you, and then you. If you're fast, and the panel is succinct. Thank you. I'm following on that. Um, I don't have any sense that people really feel that they're getting the money back and it's coming to them directly. But but the discussion I mean, you don't you don't hear any any talk about that that it's uh, that the, the the neutrality is appreciated. People get upset if the taxes go up, but they don't get upset. They don't seem to appreciate in the same way if, uh, if if their taxes stay down, and that makes me wonder why we aren't moving more towards uh, uh, investments, particularly in infrastructure. I would I would argue particularly in transit uh, that have a more visible benefit to the. To the general public, rather than the uh, the, uh, the refund that they get on on their income tax form that, we, that they almost quick, uh, immediately forget about. And I think this is, you know, economics will give you an interesting perspective, and then you sort of throw it in the pot and you make a decision with lots of other things. And so, um, I, I think you're on to a good point, and I don't actually think there's one right answer to that. It, it is true, for example, one of the largest constituencies that where we see people, uh, I wouldn't say protest the carbon tax, but challenge it, is in fact northern and rural homeowners. And they have one of the best refund mechanisms we've got, which is a northern and rural homeowner benefit. They get $200 every year. And, and based on picking some examples of someone with a Ford F-150 and a large home on natural gas, they, I would say they make money, like barring extreme behavior. Uh, and yet we don't see a strong lobby of northern and rural homeowners to try to, to continue that. And it's, uh, it's where economics and voting behavior part ways. And that's why I think fundamentally these have to be public discussions and political decisions. And we could lobby Canada Revenue Agency to put on your tax form. This, you know, your taxes were lowered by X amount due to the BC carbon tax. I mean, that sounds facetious. but. You're absolutely right that we don't have a mechanism to say, here's how you have saved money. And you know, it'd be even better if we could say, you know, you've you've substituted for public transit for, for driving a vehicle. You've saved even more money that way. But it, it's a really good point. We'll go up there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a couple of comments, Nick. Uh, really like what you did on carbon tax, gasoline consumption answered a question that's been rolling for me for a very long time, so thanks for that. Uh, with regards to your quick comment there about putting a line on the bottom of the tax return that says this is how much you saved on taxes because of the carbon tax, there has to be another line that says this was your tax burden because yeah. of the carbon tax. Yeah. So That's what I mean. If you, you look you at need the total two together. Oh, yeah, I can't have it both. But okay, fair enough. My real question, if I could. Thank you. <laughs> well, you can. Well, but but they see that. Okay, I've, yeah. I've heard uh, a lot of people say lately that 
the carbon tax, British Columbia carbon tax, one of the best designed tax policies or carbon policies uh, that they've seen around the world. I've heard it often enough that I'm beginning to believe it, James. But and I <laughs> promise I wouldn't set this question to James. But but what jumps out at me and has jumped out at me from the beginning is that the BC carbon tax completely ignores the issues of leakage, trade exposure, and competitiveness, and and that those issues typically are front and foremost in other climate policies. So the question I have is. The carbon tax as a design now, does it become better when trade exposure, competitiveness, and leakage are considered, or does that hurt the tax? And, and before you answer, I'll just quickly explain where I'm from. I'm from the uh, cement industry. And uh, James mentioned earlier that uh, coal consumption in the province has decreased significantly in the last uh, few years, and I can tell you that's because we've decreased our consumption because imported products have taken over our own, our own domestic production. So we've had to shutter the plant, send people home, because products coming from China, and it's a short boat ride from China, unlike in Germany perhaps, where the weight of the material impacts the shipping cost. It's a very short uh, trip from China to, to BC, or in fact to Washington State. And uh, these products are being sold in our market uh, without uh, the extra additional cost of the carbon tax. So while we have reduced our coal consumption, and we're the only coal, consume, uh, coal combustors in the province, it's, be, it's not as though those emissions didn't occur. And notwithstanding this gentleman's comments about metallurgical coal going to China, it's entirely likely that we've shipped coal to China, they've used it to make cement, it has come in the back door without any tax whatsoever, and it's putting local workers out of, uh, out of a job. So these are very real issues for us. Back to the question, does the carbon tax become better when trade exposure, competitiveness, and leakage are considered, or does it, uh, does it hurt the, the policy? Well, let, like, let me start in there, Jasper, by saying probably one of the best things that happened from the carbon tax is it brought you and me together. And I mean that a bit uh, as a joke, but it's actually serious. Uh, you know, the cement industry, the conversation we've had with the cement industry, first off, as a public service, we've got an intimate knowledge now, uh, and that may be frustrating to industry, but an intimate knowledge about the carbon footprint of our industries. And to be honest, it's scary to say in 2012, but we're still learning a lot about just what we're emitting in BC and what our options are to deal with it. So. Just to talk about the cement sector, they're looking at reducing the greenhouse content of the product they sell. We've worked with the cement industry on changing building code standards. We're trying to get early projects going with our Ministry of Transportation so we can deploy cement in different ways, which will have a lower impact. They've looked at using biomass and waste streams. Uh, they've looked at using natural gas. And all these things have an innovation benefit for BC and also an emissions benefit. So now, one of the best parts about being in a review is you don't have to answer questions like that, and so I'll leave that one to others. I will say there's two things that, that we're looking at very seriously. One is from a climate perspective. Do good climate policies, if they end up not having an environmental benefit because emissions in the state of Washington go up and in BC go down, then that's not an effective climate policy. And as you know, we've done a lot of work with you to really understand that and uh, to make sure we avoid that outcome. The second one, though, is when you look at a policy that's in place, if we have industries that have invested in efficiency or deploying clean energy, using and they've secured financing from the financial sector to do it, if the carbon tax is in that return on investment, we want to look very carefully to make sure that we don't change things that ends up stranding that investment. And we, we need to look very carefully at those industries that have moved and make sure we honor the capital investments that they've made. So that's just to say, you know, fully agree with the considerations. Uh, obviously can't talk about where it needs to go, but we want to look at those issues and structure a way to do it. We've got the benefit of many, many jurisdictions internationally have a carbon price in place and have looked at this. So we actually have a wealth of models to choose from on how to deal with and it. And here's one of the wealthy models right next to us. So comments. Well, uh, just a comment on cement, but um, I suppose many of you will know, but China nowadays has 50% of the global cement production. Uh, but the key is they are using it, all of it themselves. Uh, because they have a large um, rural population which is coming into these cities which are, are growing. Uh, there, is, there are figures for China's cement export, and I've seen them, and they are very, very small, but maybe it all goes to Vancouver, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I shouldn't say that. So, um, but having said that, I mean, it's also in Europe been one of the key industries, and um, 
just on the flight here from Denmark, I could read a full one-page article uh, about what um, Denmark's cement industry is doing now to reduce its carbon footprint. Uh, and uh, for a while, uh, some efficiency measures have been introduced, but now they are moving and innovating into a completely new type of uh, low-carbon cement. Uh, this is uh, the Portland technology that's coming into a new generation. So obviously in this industry, there's now um, a struggle to see who will first move into new and more energy efficient types of, of cement. And, uh, but that yeah. innovation is expensive. Um, and they need to yeah. be protected from yeah. lower cost products, which in Europe, I believe, but I, I okay, agree. we're going to have to I, move on to the last question. But it does it does reinforce the comment made by the panel about national is better than local, and adjustments that can be made in terms of things like border tax adjustments, which would again level the playing field. One other thing you have to be careful of is and we saw this with the U.S. Waxman Markey Bill, and I think cement probably does have a legitimate case that it's you know among those that are significantly affected. But one of the beauties of a carbon tax is that it's clean, it's simple, it doesn't require eight years of policy making, which is what it's taken us to try and work on a national cap and trade system where everyone lines up and says, I'm special, treat me differently. You look at the U.S. Waxman Markey Bill, I don't know how many hundreds of pages it was, but mostly it was all the special treatment that everyone says, I'm different. And BC's carbon tax took two months to get through, and other people have been talking for five years. So. It isn't to say that, and I'm not diminishing, I think your point actually probably is as probably more legitimate than most of the other industries, but once you open the door a little bit, and they've already done it with horticulture, everyone else is going to walk in and say, well, if they were special, I'm special, I'm special, I'm special, I'm special, and you could spend a lot of time with a very cluttered policy agenda. So I think they probably will do something for you, but the one thing I would say is take some of the money and just reinvest it in technology. Uh, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> let's not pro project. We have a, a member of the uh, Carbon Action Secretariat here, but again, I think the points have been well made. I have time. I, we're, we're absolutely at the end of the time. Carbon Talks says we promise to get you out of there. So you have been very patient. You have a five-second question, and the panel will have a two-second answer. Uh, I guess in five seconds, I would just say I love the carbon tax. I support it a lot. At the same time, the amount of carbon in BC's economy is going up radically since we've introduced the carbon tax. It's just huge. And that's because we don't count most of it, and we don't tax most of it. And therefore, for example, coal, we give billions of dollars. We give a $1.5 billion subsidy to shipping it out of the country and burning it somewhere else than we do, you know, burning it here. So until I, I just think the carbon tax has to be expanded to include more of the economic carbon in BC, or we'll have this distortion of our carbon in our economy. I, you know, so I think in terms of agreeing with the importance of the issue and agreeing with the importance of policies, I'm I'm with you. I think, you know, Sierra Club issued a report recently which criticized. Uh, BC's emissions, just to point out, they actually acknowledge that the way we report our emissions is accurate, it's done consistent with everybody internationally, but then it pointed out some of these issues, which to be frank, no one else does, like taking responsibility for what other people, and if you look at the comments on coal, uh, our coal is metallurgical coal, so are we going to think that's different than coal-fired electricity and what we know, and so we get into lots of judgment calls there. I think what's important is you know, internationally there's work to look at, the decisions you make. I think uh, BC's in a pretty good spot. It's a good time to have a review. It's good discussions on how ambitious we want to be on the next step. Open and transparent and get your thoughts out there. And thank you everybody for coming, for your excellent questions. And I'd like to thank the panel for their superb presentations and Carbon Talks and uh, Sustainable Prosperity for bringing these people to you. Thanks. Thank you.